indeed. <laughs> hey, friend. Hey, friend. <laughs> I, uh, so Deja just said a word, enamored, and that really just stood out to me. And I think that's just like the perfect way to describe how so many people feel when they meet you. It's just this, just enamored by just your spirit and your kindness and your talent, um, your, your insight, and just who you are. So I just want to just formally say thank you for having me. Uh, for inviting me to and asking me to be a part of this conversation. Oh, I, I could not think of anyone else that I wanted to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, and just so people know, like we have a little bit of history. We're, mm -hmm. uh, I say old friends, like air quotes. We met in 2022. Yes. And you were curating for Arthello Beck Jr. Yes. And I was so excited. We hadn't met. And I remember saying, oh my gosh, I have two of his pieces. And so I brought two of my personal pieces in my little budding art collection um, to show you that I was also a fan of your dear old friend. Yes. Um, and so that was just, that was kind of where it started, right? Yeah, that's where it started. Yeah, at the, we just at the African hit it completely off. We yeah. just hit it off. <laughs> at the African American History Museum. And yes. I was just blown away by you and just your work and what you do. So, you. Um, but today we're here to talk about you. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Which I know makes you a little nervous, but yes, you deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. Um, art chapters, the book of Jennifer. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first thing that I want to kind of point out is that this has been called a personal memoir. What is the significance of the timing of this exhibition in terms of where you are in your life right now? Oh, goodness. Well, um, I have been a professional artist for 30 years, but I had my first solo show with Daisha back in February of 2022. For the past 30 years, I've basically put my career on the back burner to basically be a wife and mother. Um, my youngest daughter graduated back in 2021. Um, I was a curator at the African American Museum from 2018 to 2021 and after my husband and I um, daughter youngest daughter graduated from high school my husband looked at me and he said babe come on home and I'm like say less <laughs> so I um, basically once I came home I had space and I had time I had mental space to just breathe and do me which I had not had before so um, just by him inviting me to come back home and, and like, babe, I got you, it was everything. Because I know a lot of people do not have that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, I've been doing this for 30 years and it's something as a female creative and we have a tendency to put our, our needs on the back burner for our family. And, and it's not that anyone placed that on me, I placed it on myself because of societal um, norms of what norms <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that should not be, but I did it to myself, but I'm reclaiming me <laughs> and Amen. going for my art career full throttle and unapologetically. Wow, I love that. And you talked about just the space and it's not lost on me that this is just aesthetically a spacious environment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I feel like that's a reflection of where you are in your life is just giving yourself the space and then giving your art the space to be received mm -hmm. in this way. Absolutely, absolutely. Because I know that um, when I first met Daisha back in, I guess it was 2018, 2019, at the African American Museum, she, I was curating my first exhibition ever. It was called Hashtag Us Two Phenomenal Woman. And I believe my sis, um, Evita, told um, Daisha about me and she showed up at the museum and she said, I just had to meet you and she came bearing gifts. <laughs> and we've been friends ever since. And she, when I signed with Black Sheep Art Culture back in, I guess it was early 2021, before the gallery even opened, um, I knew that she was the one to represent me, you know, because the thing is, is that when the gallery and or art agent relationship with an artist, it has to be someone um, that emulates you because sometimes that's the person they're gonna see before they even meet you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's the person they're, that's, that you 
have there has to be a level of trust yeah. um, in a partnership um, because they're the ones that's going to speak your name when you're not in the room. Yeah, and she speaks my name all the Hi. time. And yes, <laughs> all the time, yeah. and I speak her name all the time. So it's definitely a partnership um, because if she wins, I win. If I win, she wins. Yeah. So that's the way I look at it. Um, that's just how I look at it. So there has to be a level of trust. Um, you have to trust the process because it's a process. Um, because again, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been here. I didn't just drop out of the sky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let them know. I've been here. I've been doing this forever. And my friend Jill, she's told me that I need to change my language instead of saying trying. So I tried to make an effort. See, I just said try. <laughs> <laughs> just caught myself. So I'm doing. Yes. <laughs> instead of trying, I'm doing. So I'm really trying to change my language because words have power. And also, you get what you put out. So I really try again. <laughs> You're doing. I am doing um, to change my language, you know, and, and manifest what I want. So because words have power. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good lesson for everybody is that, yes. you know, you really can speak into existence, which it, existence, what you want to see. Absolutely. Um, and so we spoke about a, this conversation before we got here. And I said, I really I do want to get into the exhibition, but I also want to get into just the psyche of Jennifer and who Jennifer is and what's inspired you and what's motivated you and kept you going. And it's it's so funny how just. God, the universe works, um, is that I had a question about how your grandmother has inspired your journey. Mm -hmm. And you just happened to bring a purse yes. that was your grandmother's purse. Absolutely. And so, so talk about how, you know, before we got here, this person who was so instrumental in, in your journey. Absolutely. My grandmother was a fashionista. Um, she really was. She worked at Neiman Marcus, she was a seamstress, she made most of my clothes growing up along with my sister, my younger sister, and she was one of my biggest supporters. Um, she saw my talent when she passed away back in 98, when we went to clear out her things. Um, she had some of my drawings from when I was a little girl in her bedroom framed, <laughs> framed, which was everything, because sometimes, um, because when she passed away in 98, you don't see things like that that she's kept for 25 years, you know? Because yeah. at the time, I was 30 when she passed away, and she's kept my things for 25 years since wow. I was like five, because I've been painting since I was five. Yeah. So she was the first version of what Deja is to you today. Yes. And this is actually her bag. And it's just so funny that you mentioned my grandmother because I just happened to carry this bag today. And this was her bag and it was falling apart. Um, but I could not bear to get rid of it. And so I sent it to my friend Poochie. Uh, Poochie lives in me and that is his name. His name is Poochie. And he was named Poochie after his, his grandmother named him. And he resides in Nashville and he had a solo show here at the South Dallas Cultural Center, and I sent it to him, and he painted it for me, and he included her name, and a lot of sayings that I like to say, and a lot of things about me, and he also signed, and he was so stressed out about <laughs> painting this bag, and I gave him complete creative control, because since I'm an artist, I, I don't like to limit another artist's vision. I give them complete creative control, which is one reason why I don't do a lot of commissions, because when I do commissions and there's too much input mm. from the patron, it's no longer my work. So when I do a commission, the patron has zero input. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Zero <laughs> input, because it's like, it's like putting raisins in a potato salad. I'm just saying. And like, we know yeah. that that don't <laughs> Mm -mm. Yeah, <laughs> ma'am. Because no, sometimes they think they know what they want, but they don't. They don't. You <laughs> so. gotta show, you, sometimes you have to show people what exactly. they want. Exactly. They don't know what they want until you show them. Exactly. Right? Um, did you foresee when you found, when you went back to your grandmother's house and you're cleaning out her closet and you're finding this, did you foresee this? Like, was this, was that a foretelling of this moment? 
You know, um, I was so deeply ingrained in being a mom at the time because I believe uh, my son was a year old at the time. And little did I know I was pregnant with my second child. So I was so ingrained in being a wife and a mother, I didn't really think about it. Really didn't think about it um, because I lost myself in motherhood mm -hmm. and in my marriage. And I didn't really think about it, although I was still creating, but I would create like maybe once a year um, because I started a doing a little show at our house at my husband's suggestion mm -hmm. uh, the first December, the first uh, Saturday of December of every year, and I did that for about 20 years. Wow. Yeah. I, I have to ask, and I'm going off script here, but you know, are there any pieces in this in this collection, this exhibition, that reflect that chapter of your life where you were not fully immersed in 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 the space that you are now, where things were kind of on the back burner, but you were still pushing through to create? Absolutely. There's a piece hanging on this wall towards the back called Bantu Goddess, and it's of a fertility doll because I started off doing a bunch of Akua dolls, which is a symbol for, an African symbol for fertility. So I did a lot of pieces with the Akua doll in it because that's where I was in my life. And at that time, I was somewhat fertile myrtle, so. <laughs> <laughs> just cranking the babies out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, in Uganda, you were pregnant right along with me, so. <laughs> yes, so we were pregnant at the same time, but um, while our husbands were in seminary. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that piece really f reflects that because in Bantu Goddess, she's with Chow. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I was in my life at the time, because I tell everyone I was either pregnant or nursing somebody for 10 years straight. <laughs> God bless. Yes. God. So what's your advice on, on women who might find themselves, uh, whether they're creatives or whatever their journey may be, um, where they're just trying to press through and press into their calling and press into that talent and press into that gifting, but maybe feeling a little derailed if that's if that's a, an appropriate word yeah um, never give up on yourself despite what anyone tells you D um, because there are some people who do not understand um, the time it takes to be an artist or a person in the arts mm -hmm. or what it requires and just do not ever give up on yourself and do not let other people get in your head mm. because that's other people did get in my head Mm. Yeah. So do not let them get in your head. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask, is there, are, are we seeing a certain level of transparency and vulnerability in different parts of this, this collection, right? Throughout yes. the years. So yes. walk us through the levels of transparency, the levels of vulnerability um, with each maybe decade mm -hmm. or just chapter in your life. Absolutely. So, um, Early on, I tried to play it safe and tried to create pieces that I thought that people wanted to see and was trying to create safe art. Mm. So mm. this is one of my earlier pieces, which was inspired by my friend Rhea's quilt called The Underground Railroad, and this one is called The Underground Railroad Revisited. So I did a lot of safe pieces, and then I also ventured off into more religious pieces. So I did a lot of crosses and things like that. And then after I really start to really think about things and evaluate where I am in my life, I start to take more chances and start to take more risk and say, forget this, I'm going for it. So I started putting my body <laughs> in pieces. And I first debuted a piece called um, Dr. Feelgood. Mm by, um, based off the song by Aretha Franklin. Okay. And <laughs> it had a full body print on it. And uh, I was a little nervous about showing it because it was in our house. Because remember, I was doing art shows in my house. Mm -hmm. And I hung it by our bedroom door because when I would have shows at the house, I would have the entire house open. So I hung it by the bedroom door trying to hide it. So nobody could see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so no one would see it. And then that was the first one that one of the guys I would dance with, because my husband and I are both swing out dancers. So one of the guys um, 
that I danced with, he came in with his girlfriend, and that was the first piece that he gravitated toward. And then he had the nerve <laughs> to ask me about it. <laughs> so what's this about? Who yeah. Is this? So that made it worse because I was so nervous because it was my body, <laughs> and this was yeah. a man that was asking, asking me about, about it. Your body. Yes. 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 So yes. <laughs> what was the catalyst for just saying, you know what? I'm just gonna go for it. Like, and what did that moment do for you? Right. Somebody a man, mm -hmm. you know, who's not your husband, who's looking at this work of art, what did right. that do for you? It was actually very freeing. Mm -hmm. It was very freeing. And it wasn't necessarily validation. It was just freeing for me to just continue to forge forward with taking risk mm -hmm. and not being afraid mm -hmm. and not caring what someone else thinks, yeah. you know, about what I'm doing um, and the subject matter of the pieces. So that was, that was a learning lesson for me to just really go for it yeah. and to just go for it, no, no holes bar. Just right. go for it and just put it out there because even though I've basically lived pretty much a conservative life, I'm very much a free spirit, very much so. And just go for it and not care what someone else has to say or do because the thing is just that I have one life one, there are no do-overs. <laughs> none, none. And you have to live your life to the fullest. And I don't wait on people to do things. I just do it, you know? Because Amen if you that. sit around and wait around on people, some things where you will never get done, yeah. period. So I don't wait around on people. And if I plan something and someone don't show up, I do it anyway. <laughs> anyway, we'd be talking no matter what, if it exactly. were just you and I in here, but, but exactly. so many people love and admire your work. It, are there moments when the, the freedom and the vulnerability sort of ebb and flow, right? Or mm -hmm. is it that was that the, the floodgates opened in that moment and it's reflected in your art from that moment on? Absolutely, because one of the pieces that was most, one of the most personal pieces for me was a piece that I created of our youngest daughter, Willow, um, when she went through a very challenging time back in 2019, in early 2019, and I was curating my first um, exhibition at the African American Museum, mm -hmm. and I created a portrait of her. And when I created the portrait of her, I hung it in the museum along with the artwork of, of 19 other women because the show featured 20 African-American female artists that are native to Texas and primarily here to Dallas. And people would ask me about the piece and the story behind it and I would just gloss over the story because I wasn't ready to talk about it. And then I hung it at another location at Pencil and Paper Gallery. Again, people would ask me about the piece, I would gloss over the story. Up until I had my first solo show ever um, with Daisha back in 2022, and remember I had been in the game for 30 years, yeah. and that was my first solo show. So there was a collector from Fort Worth who came with a large group of people and they asked me about my favorite piece. And when I, when I created that piece, I really didn't have, in, um, did not plan to talk about it. But with that particular show, the show was called Patchwork, and that particular portrait inspired all the portraits that I do. So I had to include it, but I wasn't ready to talk about it. Wow. So when I started talking about it, I was in tears. And I wasn't expecting to be crying like that, um, but I had everybody crying. <laughs> I wasn't trying to. Um, but it's not that misery loves company, but it was relatable. It was an experience that was relatable um, for one parent to another, where the other mothers were coming up to me and saying, I'm still dealing with this with my daughter. Um, I'm not on the other side of this, and I just had to go outside and call my son, let him know that I love him, and all of that. So one of the most beautiful experiences from that, and just learning how to accept a gift, is one of the collectors came through and she said to me, she said, I have the honor of having one of your pieces hanging in my house, because I purchased this one, but I'm also going to purchase the piece of your daughter but I'm gifting it back to you. Mm. So you can continue wow. to tell the story. And I was crying all over again. <laughs> because it was such a generous gift. Yeah. And I felt seen. Mm. Yeah. 
feeling seen? I mean, as an artist, I imagine that there are moments when you maybe people miss it, right? They just yeah. don't quite get it. Yeah, yeah. And I felt that way for years. I felt mm -hmm. unseen for years. Yeah, it felt like the weirdo, um, the oddball walking around. We see you. Yeah. Sorry, oh. <laughs> but it really matters to feel seen and to be seen, um, especially for so many years of not being seen for what I do and what I bring to the table and what I'm trying to do. And a pivotal moment for me was my little art sis right here, Jay, who's working on another documentary. She saw me and she started following me back in 2019. And she said, Jennifer, you're an activist. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> yes, you are. She said, yeah. yes, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> yes, you are. And she said, yes, you are. And I kept telling her, you're an artist. <laughs> and she said, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this back and forth. And, and when she did this, uh, she's working on this documentary right now. Um, called To Get Her, mm -hmm. and it all spearheads from the, from the first show that I ever curated from, from the African American Museum. And it was the first thing that I ever curated, and I, have, I do not have a curatorial background. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's, it's all about opportunity, because Dr. Robinson took a chance on me. He provided an opportunity. Yeah. And with me not having um, any curatorial experience whatsoever. He just happened to send me a text on a Sunday afternoon and asked me if I was interested in part-time work at the African American Museum. And my response was, it depends. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because I'm mm -hmm. just not gonna do any and everything. Right. And right. because, you know, he may have been calling me to come in and scrub toilets. And, and it's not, not that gonna I'm, do. Right, <laughs> and it's not that I'm above yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I don't wanna do, do that. that. Right, right. <laughs> I don't want well, to do okay. that. Yeah. So when he said um, curator um, and over the summer program, I said, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And you and I were talking and you said, you know, some folks who show up to this, this talk know me as an artist. Mm -hmm. Some people don't know me as a curator. Exactly. Just yeah. so that you all know she's both, yeah, right? I'm both. How, how matter. important is that for people to embrace that you are both. Yeah, that I'm multifaceted. I'm just not just um, one dimensional. Yeah. I'm multifaceted. My, my mind does not stop. Mm -hmm. It's constantly running. It's constantly running. <laughs> You've even said that daydreaming is a, is a form of creating for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Like daydreaming, which is something that so many of us have been reprimanded for, have been punished for, have been told that is it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And yet daydreaming is is a form of, of creating for you. Yes, I am definitely a dreamer. I'm a Pollyanna. I'm an optimistic. I try to see the good in everybody. Sometimes it's hard, <laughs> but I do try. I really do try. I really try to find a positive attribute in every single person that I meet and encounter, including people that I don't, that I do not know. I try to find something good in everybody because what I do not want is for someone to view me um, a certain type of way unless they see the good in me because I really try to see the good in everybody. Yeah. And although some people may not necessarily deserve it, but I try, I really do, I really do try. Yeah, it's who you are and I think that's what all of us know about you. Thank you. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned that when you uh, debuted the, the piece of work with your daughter, it was amongst other mm -hmm. black women artists who were from Dallas. Yes. You are born and raised in Oak Cliff. Yes. Um, talk about the influence that the Oak Cliff community has had on your work throughout the years as we talk oh, about um, you know, the chapters of Jennifer Callie. Oh, goodness. Well, um... I'm trying to think here because growing up in Oak Cliff was magical. Um, I still believe that Oak Cliff is one of the most beautiful parts of Dallas uh, with all the trees and all the hills and 
um, it's, it's just gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. And I was never afraid growing up in Oak Cliff. And even when my husband and I bought our first house in Oak Cliff, right off of Illinois, when I would mention that I lived in Oak Cliff, people like, Oak Cliff? Oh, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's how it used to be. Yeah. yeah. And I'm yeah. like, we never experienced any negative, negative um, backlash or anything in the neighborhood. We never experienced what some people would deem as violence and gunshots. We didn't, that was not our experience. We did not, we, we weren't hitting the floor every night. We weren't, <laughs> right. we weren't, we right. were not doing right. that. <laughs> right. So that was not our experience. And even growing up, that was not my experience. Right. Yeah. So I want to ask, how did you explore and how do you allow us, you know, to also explore and get insight into your identity through these pieces of work, right? How do you explore your sense of identity and then allow that to transfer to the person who is the collector and the consumer of your work? Absolutely. Um, my artwork is unapologetically feminine because I am a female and I can only paint from a female perspective. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a lot of my newer pieces have to do with the objectification of women mm -hmm. and for us to be whoever it is that we are without someone placing labels on us. Mm -hmm. Whether, um, for instance, like this piece over here is called objectification, creeping, looking, touching. And again, it's my body print, so I turn my breasts into eyes and that represents the creeping and the looking, mm -hmm. the hand prints, represent the creeping and the unwarranted touch. Mm -hmm. And the heart on the piece means to look to my inside and not to my outside, that I'm more than what my exterior represents. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of that has to do with the objectification of women and me being unapologetically female. Yeah. Yeah. What are some other lived, you know, you talk about you want your work to be about lived human experiences. Mm -hmm. And what are some of those other human experiences that you want to convey through your work? Oh, goodness. To live <laughs> and just go for it and just do it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, experience life mm -hmm. and stop playing it so safe. Mm -hmm. You know, because, again, you have one life. Yeah. And why are you playing it safe? And of, of course, be cautious and you're not going to put yourself in harm's way. Don't do anything stupid, you know. Don't go and run into traffic, you know. <laughs> right, right. But right. Take it, do not be afraid to take risk, yeah. you know, because when you take risk, you know, that's when it, things, happen, things happen, you know. Yeah, because like Zora Neale Hurston said, if you don't jump, then you're saying, what's the, my husband knows, what's the, what's What's the quote? Jump at the sun. Yeah, if you don't jump at the sun, then what are you doing? Yeah. Your feet don't ever leave the ground. You have to, you have to leave the ground. <laughs> you have to jump. Is this moment one of those moments for you? Absolutely. This, this actual present moment? That we're Absolutely, in. because when Daisha approached me um, back in November, <laughs> and some would say short notice, but as an artist, you have to be ready. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to be ready. You can't sit on your hands and be waiting, you know, and you don't have anything ready, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was already preparing to go to Art Basel because we were going to Art Basel last year and it did not pan out. Mm -hmm. But uh, when she approached me about having a solo show in January, my first thought was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but me being me, I'm not going to turn it down. Mm -hmm, I'm going to mm -hmm, figure it out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And... I, I'm going to make it happen, you know? And when she turned around and said, well, can you fill the entire gallery? I was like, if I could show I sure old can. work, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I brought in all the work. And I even have more pieces um, that are online because mm -hmm. it was a lot yeah. of work. And when I brought all the work in, Daisha was like, oh, my God. Because <laughs> it was so much work to the point where my work spills out onto that side of the gallery, too. <laughs> it's the life of an artist yeah. and a life well lived and a life of a creator. Like, yeah. I, I love it. I love it. You have to be ready because these opportunities do not come around that often. Yeah. They do not. So you have to be ready. You have to be ready. 
because you never know where life is going to take you mm -hmm. and, and what opportunities are going to present themselves. Mm -hmm. So you have to be ready to the point where I have artwork hanging at the FBI, FBI headquarters right now. Right. The Becoming. Becoming yeah, is one of the pieces that stood out and resonated with me. Yes. That's hanging Talk about that. How did, how did that even come about? Absolutely. So from my first solo show uh, back in 2022, I was trying to piece together a body of work, mm -hmm. and the show was called Patchwork. And Patchwork is pivotal because it's me piecing together my life, my career, and a body of work, mm -hmm. and trying to make something cohesive that makes sense, mm -hmm. you know, and not just something of some of everything just thrown in there where it's not cohesive. I want it to be cohesive and something that makes sense. So with Becoming, and again, it started off with my portrait of my youngest daughter, and I started doing portraits, and I started looking through Instagram and say, okay, let me figure this out because I want to do more portraits. And I ran across a portrait of my friend um, Valerie Gillespie who owns Pencil and Paper Gallery, and the portrait was shot by my sis, my art sis here, Missy Burden, so I asked her permission to use her photograph of Val, mm -hmm. and Val had no idea that I was painting her. Wow. <laughs> and the pose, and it's so funny because with the pose, she's in a, she's in a, um, goodness, I'm trying to think of the name of the pose. She's in a, um, is it a, like a yoga pose? Balance pose. Okay. It's a okay. yoga balance she's, pose because yeah. she's a yoga instructor mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And she's in a balance pose. And when I start thinking about the pose and then also her color palette, because she had a solo show at the African American Museum that I gave her mm -hmm. because I started a heritage nook at the African American Museum in order to bring other artists mm -hmm. in to give them opportunities at the African American Museum. So her series was called Becoming. So when I thought about the series that she created, also her color palette in the pose that she was in, and I started thinking deeper because I'm a very deep thinker, and I said, okay, the narrative behind this piece is that once you strike that balance in your life, once you reach a certain age, you become the person that you were truly meant to be. So that's what that piece is about. I love it. Because that you. resonates with me. And so it's it's a treat to get to speak to the artist herself personally about what, because you do, you see that pose off the edge of mm -hmm. the, if, I don't know if you all have seen Becoming, but off the edge of the frame, mm -hmm. and then all of the colors. So talk about colors and composition. Because I know that's a big part of your creative process. Mm -hmm. Talk about that and what that actually means. Absolutely. So um, when I first went off to college, I was in a, I was in the pre-dental program at UTA. I am not into science. <laughs> and I'm no longer embarrassed to say this. I'm just going to say it, and I'm probably going to embarrass myself anyway, but I'm going to say it anyway. When I finished up, my GPA was like a 1.5. Listen, <laughs> sometimes it be that way. Yeah, <laughs> and because I was not filling those classes, period. <laughs> I was not filling it. Hey. <laughs> Therefore, I did not, <laughs> I did not apply myself, mm -hmm. and but I'm also very tenacious. Right. So I kept at it, and I changed my major to architecture, and I was in architecture school for three and a half years. Got my GPA up all the way to 3.0, and while I was in architecture school, um, it shows up in my work with all the straight lines and the um, structure, and also color theory because I do study a lot with color theory and with uh, complementary colors and primary colors, secondary colors, tertiary colors, and colors that are opposite of the color wheel, so to play with the eye. So I do a lot with that, do a lot with that. So I want to I want to just kind of veer off a little bit about, you know, when you talk about being tenacious and your GPA was not reflective of who you were. It was not reflective of your skills, your talents, your gifting. Is there a message for people who, you know, maybe have struggled in that same area? Right. Yeah. Because, I mean, I had some semesters that weren't worth writing home about either. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and yet here you are and here we are. Absolutely. So with that, I believed in myself, and I knew that I was going to finish no matter what. 
It took me seven years, but I, I have a degree. Mm -hmm. I finished, I transferred to a different school because I did get married early. Um, we got married back in 91. We were both juniors in college and we both transferred to UTD and graduated in 93. So I have a degree in art and performance from University of Texas at Dallas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you've got the, the, the paperwork to back up oh, what you do here for mm -hmm. sure. Absolutely. So your pieces, I wanna to go to the piece that's inspired by G's Bend, mm -hmm. um, which is a black community in Alabama known very specifically, they are descendants of uh, enslaved people mm -hmm. known for their quilt work. Absolutely. Um, and we've got this piece hanging here. Talk about your pieces that are inspired by G's Bend. Oh my gosh. Um, I had never heard of these quilters until 2006 when I journeyed down to Houston to the late great Eugene Phoney's gallery called Art Cetera, and I had an art show there along with art with Frank Frazier and my late friend um, Wendell Gordon. And when I was down there, my friend Avis flew down there, and we both went to the Fine Arts Museum in Houston. Mm -hmm. And when we went to the museum, there were quilts hanging everywhere. It was in a space as large as this in the museum in one of the galleries, and I had never heard of these quilters before. Mm -hmm. And they were hanging from the ceiling, on the wall, they were everywhere, and they were just absolutely magnificent. So I was so inspired that I went into the gift store and purchased every single book that they had in the gift shop and came home and did a whole series on it. Mm. And when I did the whole series, I sold all of them except for two. And actually there's one on the other side of this wall. Mm -hmm. And that piece I actually hung at the African American Museum for their Carol Harris Sims show back in 2006, along with the other piece that my friend Rhea, who actually inspired this piece, purchased. Wow. <laughs> Yes. Full circle moments. Yes. Right. Full circle moment. Yeah. yeah. But all my pieces are inspired by the quilters of Geese Bend because one thing that I want to do is pay homage to my ancestors because my great great grandmother was a quilter as well. And some people say, oh, your work looks like Mondrian. And I'm like, are you inspired by Mondrian? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm inspired by the quilts of Geese Bend, Alabama mm -hmm. because I definitely want to give our ancestors the credit for what's inspiring my work, including the portraits, because if you notice, I start doing a lot of collaging in my work, and it's the piecing together, just like when you piece together a quilt, along with the stitching, it's the act of piecing and uh, something together, because quilts were used to keep you warm, yeah. quilts were used as a roadmap, as a means to escape, also they were used for storytelling. And the storytelling is very key, especially with critical race theory going on right now. And our history is, is being erased in real time. So it is up to us to keep our history alive, um, rely on that oral history, and it's gonna be the artists, the creatives that's going to keep this alive. The literary artists, the uh, visual artists, the, the filmmakers, um, the dancers, yeah. the actors, all of that to keep our history alive is important. It's very, very, very important. And it's also very important to listen to your elders and sit at the feet of your great grandmother and your aunts and your parents because with our history, for people to say, oh, that happened a long time ago, it did not happen that long ago. Because um, there are people that you can reach back and touch that actually experience a lot of racism and heinous acts. And I, my husband and I just watched um, the story about the Osage uh, people in Oklahoma. And those two, um, the two um, people who were doing the most heinous things, one of those people didn't die until like 1989. Yeah. That wasn't that long ago. So that stuff is still happening and some of those people are still living yeah. and that stuff is still in their core. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So there's a sense of responsibility, especially being an artist. Absolutely. In Texas, yes. where, as you mentioned, critical race theory mm -hmm. and book bannings and that that there's an educational element to to your piece as a historical element that people can glean yes. from your from your work. Yes, absolutely. Because one thing that I do not want to do is focus on the trauma. Mm -hmm. Because um, 
we're not just about our trauma. We're about joy. joy. We're about love. We're about <laughs> acceptance. We're about learning. We're about all the things great because the cool thing is that although some hate us, mm. but they want to emulate us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. with that, oh, yeah. I'm like, we're doing something good. Oh, yeah. You know, we still have a long way to go as a people because some of us just cannot get it right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, for real. <laughs> and I will say it. I will say it all the time. I do not support janky. <laughs> <laughs> like, get yourself together. Right. I mean, get it together, yeah. you know, yeah. and stop celebrating the negative. Yeah. And because sometimes uh, we're quick to celebrate the negative when you know right from wrong, but yeah. some people, they, they just don't get that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's like we're living in a time where wrong is right, you know, yeah. and I have a problem with that. And for our people in particular, we really got to get it together. We have to get it together. Um, and I'm calling some people out because it's the truth. Yeah. It's the truth. Um, we have to get it together. If we, if we want better for ourselves, we have to do better. Yeah. We have to do better. And with that said, you know, you've said, and it's in your bio, that joy, that joy is such a central part of your work. Mm -hmm. How do you infuse joy into your work, right? How do you harness that and put it into your pieces? I have to. I have to because what I do not want to do is put negative energy mm -hmm. in my work. And back during 2020, I did not create because mm -hmm. I did not want that energy in my artwork because what you, again, you, you get what you put out. And I was in a headspace in 2020, you know, because was, of that yeah. narrative with COVID and that mm -hmm. whole narrative, like, you're all going to die. Right, you know? right. Well, <laughs> we had COVID. Die. We had George yes. Floyd. We had yes. all of that in 2020. It was a lot. Yeah, it was and a lot. I was not creating, so I did not want, I didn't want any remembrance of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I did not want to document that in my artwork. And so you set those boundaries. Oh yeah, absolutely. How do you know when to? How do you know when to set those boundaries? It, it's just a, a sense of self awareness. Yeah, yeah, just a sense of self awareness. And during that time, I took up gardening. <laughs> that was another way okay. for me to be creative. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and got me outside the house. Although it was just in my backyard, I was still outside. Yeah. And being creative and growing things and nurturing things, and I feel that that was my way of having some peace with mm -hmm. what was going on. Still an outlet mm -hmm. for, yeah. Yes. Can we talk about the juxtaposition of um, becoming and Bitches Brew? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about that? Because those are on the website right by each other. And I'm like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, well. I don't know if that was intentional, Deja, to put those <laughs> right next to each other. But there's such a stark juxtaposition, but I feel like both of them are powerful and important. So talk about that. Thank you. Well, with Bitches Brew, I created that one live on Facebook um, several years back. And I rarely go live on anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the last time I went live was just a few days ago at Deja's Urging which took me completely out of my comfort zone. <laughs> I think I saw that live. Yeah. It was so good. <laughs> Thank you. It was good. <laughs> Thank you, because I rarely go live. I just don't. It's not my thing, and it completely takes me out of my comfort zone, but I'm all for coming out of my comfort zone mm -hmm. because I, that's how I grow. Mm -hmm. But with that piece, I took a chance, and I decided to go live and paint in my studio, and I was listening um, to the LP, um, like old school, album on a record player. Mm -hmm. I was listening to Miles Davis epic album Bitches Brew mm -hmm. and I painted that piece live on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in its entirety and the handprints represent the uh, embracing of the music that I was listening to. I love this. Yeah. You just don't often get to sit and speak to the creator about what what their what mindset they were in in the moment that they were creating a piece, mm -hmm. and so it's just really a treat to to get to, to get that insight, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, those two pieces on the website are just right next to each other, and there is an, an incredible uh, juxtaposition to that. And yeah. so um, I just wondered if they had anything to do with each other 
or no. where you were in each moment of time of those creations? Well, with that particular piece, um, when I titled the piece Bitches Brew, it was me actually taking a step out, um, again, out of my comfort zone with painting live and even taking a chance on titling it um, Bitches Brew, mm -hmm. you know, because many of you do not know my husband is a pastor. <laughs> I'm the first lady of a district. <laughs> so, <laughs> go figure. <laughs> he is a district superintendent over Metro with the United Methodist Church. So, mm. he's over all the United Methodist churches here in Dallas County. So, I'm the first lady of a district. So, go figure. I have paintings called um, Bitches Brew. <laughs> I have a painting called Still Nigger. <laughs> have a painting called The Story of White People. Mm, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm, I'm mm -hmm. white, uh, okay. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, so I, I, the only person I can be is me, and yeah. I have to just be true to myself, no matter what someone might perceive, but although they may perceive that, they don't understand the gist of the message that I'm trying to convey. Mm -hmm. And in order to do what I'm doing, I can't play it safe. Yeah. Because if I'm playing it safe, I'm not being true to me mm. and the message that I'm trying to convey. So I have to be true to myself. And if I'm going to title my artwork Still Nigga, then that's what it then is. That's just what it's going to be. Gonna it's just going to be. be. And you know? if anyone has anything to say about it, then they can kick the, rocks with those shoes on. That part. <laughs> 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 that part. I yeah. want to talk about another piece. So Mind Blowing Decisions, which I'm, I'm guessing is a play on Heat Wave song. Mm -hmm. uh, what, t give us insight into that piece. Well, which is um, a great song. Great yes, song. it is a wonderful song. I am a child of the 80s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And growing up, I listened to some of everything. And I listened to Heat Wave and Always and Forever and all the different songs. And with Mind Blowing Decision, I had never heard of that song before until we just happened to be watching Unsung. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. if you know Unsung, that yeah. airs on, I think, BET, BET. or TV One. Um, it's a wonderful show, and it gives you some insight on other artists and their lives and their challenges and all the things. And so when I heard the song for the first time, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's such a wonderful it song. Is. And with Rod Pendleton, who uh, was one of the songwriters for Michael Jackson, um, and I think his name was Johnny Wilder, who was the lead singer for uh, Heat Wave. Um, when I heard the song, it was just, it just resonated with me. Yeah. And when I decided to create that piece last year, when Daisha opened up her location at the Jewel, um, said, let me do something a little different, which is a nod to some of my older works where I incorporated watercolor with um, resist with oil pastel. And then I also want to merge it with some of the things I'm doing now where I invited the stitching mm -hmm. along with mm -hmm. it. And I titled it Mind Blowing Decisions because it was a decision that I had to make in creating that piece and how far I wanted to take it with yeah. that piece. How do you decide what different techniques to bring in and how have your techniques evolved over the years and over the, the span of your career? Oh, goodness. Um, I'm always willing to try something new. Mm -hmm. So I'm always willing to experiment. And over the years, um, again, I'm not a monolithic artist, so I don't want to be no. just known as one thing. Mm -hmm. I do a whole lot. I'm a Jenny of all trades. Seriously, <laughs> I really am. Um, so with my different techniques, I just try to push the envelope and just continue to expand on it and continue to evolve. Um, and some things I just kind of leave in the past and some things I resurrect them. That's, that's good because I was going to ask you what would Jennifer, the, the, the artist, Jennifer the artist today, say to Jennifer the artist then? Keep pushing. Keep pushing, you know. Yeah, and just do it. Yeah. Would you say, try this, try, you know, the different techniques or mm -hmm. just just keep going and keep exploring? Yeah, yeah, and I would ask myself, what are you afraid of? Mm. Yeah, what are you afraid of? Just do it. Yeah. How have other artists inspired you, like Arthello Bett Jr., your late friend, Mr. Seidel, 
um, Mr. Frazier, like how have these other artists and your time spent with them and under their tutelage, like how has that impacted and shaped your work? Oh goodness, um, Frank is my mentor. Um, I met Frank back in maybe 93, 94, when I was working at Stephanie Ward's gallery. And Stephanie was the second black female gallery that opened in Dallas like well over 30 years ago with Ann Taylor being the first. And Frank walked into the gallery and asked me to pick up some thing that was about that size. And, and I don't back down from a challenge. So I picked it up. <laughs> and he said, oh, you'll do. And I was like, do what? And he said, you could go on the road with me and be my road manager. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> I had no idea who he was. And so I told him, um, I said, OK. And I said that I'm married. And he said, bring your husband by the house. I want you to meet my wife. And, and so my husband and I journeyed over to his house and met his wife, Judy, who is wonderful. If y'all do not know Judy, Judy Frazier is what makes things go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Judy is absolutely fantastic. But um, I traveled with Frank for a while, um, and that's how I got my footing that I could really do this as a career because Frank is 80 years old, mm -hmm. and he is still out there grinding mm -hmm. and traveling with his art. Mm -hmm. With his wow. art, yes, yeah. with his art. And I met Carl and Othello through Frank. And I had many a conversation with Othello mm -hmm. um, before he passed away. Um, fantastic person. He was described as a gentle giant, and it is so true. He was very soft-spoken, but just the sweetest person. And Carl, who is his best friend, who is still living, he's 80 years old. And this is a portrait of Carl right here, mm -hmm. because I am the artist. Um, behind this sculpture that I was commissioned to do um, through the city of Dallas um, in honor of Othello Beck Jr. at Twin Falls Park, which happens to be the park um, in the neighborhood that I grew up in, and Twin Falls is the park that I played in as a child. So during it, when the sculpture was being installed, Carl showed up at the installation site uh, just to see this in honor of his friend. And cool thing about Carl, Carl is so wise, so soft-spoken. He's an excellent photographer. If you have not seen his work, you would be blown away. Um, just, just a sweet, sweet man. And when he was first approached about the sculpture, back before any of us had an opportunity to work on it, he, um, they were asking him if he wanted to do it. And he said, no, let one of the younger artists do it. Mm. And it's just a testament to who he is. Mm -hmm. So he showed up that day in the park to support me, but also to support his late friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and while he was trying to show me something very profound on his phone, I snapped his picture. Mm -hmm. And that's post, free, a free, free man, mm -hmm. is that? Yeah. Wise free man. Wise free and man. Something that you all may not know is that all my portraits are titled after the meanings of the people that are in the portraits. Mm. So like this piece is called Wise Free Man because in the Bible, Carl means free man. Mm. And he is extremely wise, not because of his age, he just is. He's always been that way. And he's very soft-spoken. Like I can sit at his feet and listen to him all day because he's always going to say something that's going to make you think, just like all the time. And he's always going to say something that's very profound. And he's very soft-spoken, so you have to sit close because he talks like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he's just, he's the sweetest, the yeah. sweetest man. Yeah. How might this collection inspire people to embrace and celebrate their own stories in their own way? Again, not to be afraid. Just put it out there. Because mm -hmm. the thing is, is that art is very personal. Mm -hmm. And people aren't going to always like what you do. Mm -hmm. But somebody is. Mm -hmm. Somebody is. And one joy as an artist is that even if you touch one person, that's everything. Mm -hmm. It is everything. Because some people are just not going to get it. Yeah. And that's OK. Mm -hmm. But when that one person, when you reach one person with the artwork that you created, it's everything. Yeah. It's everything. Because there was a 
couple of people have been in since the show has been up, and some people have resonated with this piece. Mm -hmm. And I did not get a chance to meet the young woman who came in, but I heard about her, and although I did not get a chance to meet her, um, her story touched me. Mm -hmm. And this piece was inspired by Geese Band, Alabama, but she um, was from the motherland, and this piece is called Ambidestrious, mm -hmm. Structure in the Midst of Chaos, and I was told that she started crying when she saw the piece because she's left-handed. And mm -hmm. in her culture, it's like a curse to be left-handed. So they would beat it out of her. Oh. So when she moved to the United States to be with her grandmother, her grandmother tried to beat it out of her as well until she was no longer left-handed. And when I heard that story, I'm like, oh. wow. Because you never know yeah. what someone else has gone through or what they're going through or what their life experience has been. And for her to resonate with this piece of all yeah. pieces is what is the one that she resonated with. Because for me to paint this with my left hand and my right hand, mm. and I am right-handed, but I took a chance and because of a, an exercise that I was doing with the board that I sit on, where we had to do something with our non-dominant hand and our dominant hand. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that, I said, let me do something creative with this. Mm -hmm. So I took a chance and I'm very much a purist. So I painted the background with my right hand and all the little panels I painted with my left hand, including um, stitching it with my left hand. Wow. And I thought they was gonna look very childlike. Mm. And I was fully prepared to embrace the childlike qualities of it. But to my surprise, the left hand part came out better than the right hand mm. part. <laughs> who, who knew? Who knew? And I still cringe when I look at the background because again, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. Mm. And I had to apply restraint to go back and repaint the background because sometimes when I look at it, it's like, ah, you know, it bothers me that those lines are not straight. Mm. But it's an exercise in control and releasing control as well. Mm. Yeah. And, and releasing control and how it might land yeah. on, on the person who is consuming and viewing your art. Mm -hmm. And it landed in just like the most magnificent of ways. Like you couldn't have planned it that way. No. You couldn't have all. guessed that that's how it was going to, yeah. you know, be received. Yeah. I had mean, just no the power idea. of of your creations and the power of art. Yeah. Had no idea. So when I heard that story from the young lady that came in, it, it rocked me mm. because you just never know. And even like the piece um, on the other side of this wall, it's called How Black is Black, I Got Ended in Me. Mm -hmm. And it's an abstract, it's hanging next to the large blue piece with the chandelier. And back in the day, when I was growing up, um, mainly elementary school through high school, I would just proclaim, oh, I got ended in me. And although it's true, but it's like, why did I feel the need to say that? Um, because when I think about it as my 55-year-old self, it's, an effort to downplay my blackness, as yeah. though my mm -hmm. blackness by saying that I have any in me is, is better than your blackness. Mm. And when the world looks at me, all they see is a black woman. They don't see Indian, although I have Native American on both my maternal and paternal side. It's like, why did I feel the need to say that? You know, it doesn't, it's not that I'm going to, um, it's not that I want to deny my Native American heritage, but why downplay my blackness in spite of that? You know, it, it didn't add up. So I created that piece, and a lot of people are resonating with that piece because for some it strikes a nerve, mm -hmm. you know, but it's true. It's like, why they need to say it? It's like saying, oh, my great-grandfather was white. It's like, so? Right, right, <laughs> you know, right. because to the world, you're still viewed as a black person. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the piece still nigga. If you have one drop of black blood in you. Mm -hmm. That's what you are. That's what you that's are. That's what you are. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so you you center black people in in your art and you do mm -hmm. it unapologetically. Was there yes. ever a moment when you, you know, shied away from that or felt backlash from that? I mean, you do it, like I said, you center us, you do it unapologetically and it just is what it is, mm -hmm. right? It's always been that way for you. It has always been that way for me. And when I started doing the portraits, I had thought about like, what if someone that is a non black person comes to me and want me to paint their portrait. Mm -hmm. And recently I thought about that and it's like, they will still be painted black mm -hmm. because um, we all originate from the Pangea. Mm -hmm. And when I did the piece, story of the story of white people, from that piece, there was a realization that I came across when I fanned out the different paint samples of white paints, mm -hmm. and they were different varying shades of white, um, tints of white. Some were green, some were more brownish, some mm -hmm. were pink, some were lavender, but they were not pure white. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I questioned, okay, white people, you're not as white as what you think you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I will always paint portraits in black because of that, and also, people can see themselves in the portraits without looking at someone's actual face. Right. And then the other thing is that when you were in grade school, a lot of times from kindergarten, first grade, the teachers will trace your head, so it's silhouette. Yeah. So yeah. that's that. <laughs> so we want to, this has been great. I'm just like a fan. I'm fangirling right now. But we want to definitely open up the floor for folks to ask questions about your work, about this exhibition, just anything that you might want to know about Jennifer. So we definitely want to open up the floor for those of you who, who came to, to get to know our artists. Don't be shy. Oh, goodness. Mm, currently, it might be Talented Little Prophet, the little boy that's dre dressed just like Michael Jackson. Yeah, and the story behind that piece is that my husband and I went to see MJ the Musical back in December, and that little boy was sitting right in front of us on a booster seat. And during the intermission, people kept coming over to take pictures with him because he was dressed just like Michael Jackson. And his father looked at him and said, show them what you can do. <laughs> so he started moonwalking and he did the little spin, the little tippy toe thing. And I looked at my husband and I said, I need to paint him. <laughs> so I tapped his dad on the shoulder and I said, I introduced myself and I said, I promise I'm not a creep. <laughs> not, I said, actually, I'm getting ready to flex a little bit. But I do have a painting hanging at the music hall called uh, Grandiose, A Pleasant Amount of Delusion. And there's a documentary that they did on me. So they're running the trailer in the lobby of the music hall on loop. So I explained that to him. And we, he said, oh, OK, sure. So we exchanged contact information. And then I took a couple of shots of Elias. And then I went for it. And I contacted them a couple of days before my opening reception and they showed up. And oh my gosh, when Elias showed up to see his painting, it was everything. He's an eight-year-old little boy, and he's a person of color, but he's not a black person. And he is the cutest and the sweetest, and he showed up with his mother, his father, his grandmother, and his grandfather. And just to have them here meant everything to me. And just to paint a child and for a child to see himself in a piece of artwork that I created, it was, it was magical. It was magical. Absolutely. So the thread work represents Again, um, an homage to quilt makers and the piecing of something together and the creating of something. And so like on this piece, um, again, it's a nod to those ancestors and the quilt makers. And the pieces that have the strings that extend beyond the canvas um, emulate dripping paint. 
question. Tina, you talked about the early days of um, you were Susan Mother and a wife and that you would do a show every year in December at the same time. That's a long time to do all the other things. How did you um, tap into your inspiration when it was time to get ready for that show? Oh, goodness. I just had to buckle down and do it. Um, because I would start creating probably like in October because um, my kids were little. Sometimes they would help in a way that I didn't want them to help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or I remember one time um, Indigo came to me and she said, Mommy, look what I did. And she painted all over my painting. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> and I had to start over. Oh. <laughs> but I just had to do it. I just had to do it to the point where they became part of the show as well, where they start showing their work so so they can understand what mommy was doing. Yeah. Yeah. So they were selling their artwork as well. That's and Willow good. sold her first painting when she was three. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I didn't just start including them. Right. So that also gave me space to do what I need to do mm -hmm. and for them to understand so they were creating as well. Mm -hmm. Good question. Both. Sometimes I have a vision on what I want to, what I think in my mind is going to look like. And then sometimes as I'm creating, it starts to evolve and it starts to look different than what I ever imagined. Um, so like, for instance, like this piece, when I contacted Ashley to, that I wanted to do a portrait of her, she showed up at my house in a fur coat and some tights. <laughs> <laughs> a short fur coat <laughs> and some tights and she is definitely a fashion icon here in Dallas and I was thrilled to paint her and to do a portrait of her but it was also very challenging because of the fur coat and I was just thinking how on earth am I going to emulate fur because she showed up in a fur coat, <laughs> and I told her to wear whatever it was that she wanted to wear, and she did just that. So she had on sheer leopard print gloves, and I was like, okay, the leopard should be pretty easy to find in paper. Uh, not as easy as what I thought. <laughs> uh, I could not find pretty leopard print paper because her gloves were beautiful. So I ended up changing the gloves, and as far as the coat, I, st I still sat on it for a minute until my husband sent me to Joanne's to look for a gift card, to pick up a gift card for his administrative assistant. So what I did not realize is many times as I've been in Joanne's, I did not know they had like a wall of paper. Like, it was like I struck the jackpot. And I started looking through the papers, and I ran across this paper, and I was like, oh, this looks fur-like. Mm -hmm. And I bought probably like 30 sheets of that paper, mm -hmm. and I love how it turned out. It took forever. <laughs> <laughs> With all, if you really get up, on, get up close on it, you'll see all the layers, mm -hmm. all the layers. But, yeah, I just go for it. And then, like, the... Tiffany blue represents the opulence and the elegance. And Ashley is a very sophisticated young woman, so I want to emulate that in the portrait, along with the paint and also the strings. What has been the most challenging aspect of being an artist, and how have you overcome that challenge? Oh, goodness. Well, one thing I want to say with us being in uh, the tail end of uh, approaching the tail end of Black History Month, as a black female artist, a lot of times over the years, I would only get called to do things during Black History Month, mm -hmm. sometimes at the very last minute. Mm -hmm. As I've gotten older, especially over the past year, I have been saying no. No is a complete sentence. <laughs> and it's not enough just to say no. 
I tell them why I'm saying no. I tell them I am black 365 days a year. Do not call me just during Black History Month or around Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you do call me during Black History Month or around Juneteenth, I require a stipend, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as a black female artist, that's how I move and that's what I encourage other artists to do because a lot of times we get the short end of the stick. They want our work in the building. They don't want us in the building. Sounds good. Both, both. And every portrait that I do, I know these people, and these are people that I hold near and dear to my heart. I still have plenty of other portraits that I will be creating, because I have a list of people. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times I don't tell people that I'm painting them, I surprise them, mm. because I did a portrait of Daisha. She had no idea that I was doing a portrait of her during my uh, first solo show. So I, again, I title all the, portraits after the meanings of people's names. I do a lot of research. So I research colors, I research their names, um, and I do put the auras around them to hopefully capture who that person is. And I try to, not try, I do. I, I only see the positive and put the positivity in the piece because I don't want to focus on anything negative or any of that. So I want to put all the positive energy that I have and in the admiration that I have for that person in the portrait. No, I work on, I have worked on upwards of 50 pieces at one time. Again, my mind does not rest. It's constantly, <laughs> it's like a hamster on a wheel <laughs> and it's just constantly going. And since I do work primarily in acrylics and acrylic is a plastic, once you squeeze that paint out, you cannot put it back in a tube and it will dry quickly. So. A lot of times when I'm doing pieces like this or the grid pieces, I'll paint all the reds first, and then I'll paint all the yellows, and then the black is the last color to go on. So I paint like that. So if I have a bunch of pieces, I just spread them out and I just get to work on them. But um, I work on a lot of pieces at the same time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. One more good, one more question, and then we want to let you guys enjoy the ex exhibition. You know, I really didn't realize that I was an artist until I changed my major from architecture to art um, because I wanted to do something that I was passionate about and something that I loved and wasn't looking at it from a monetary standpoint um, because I graduated back in 86 and then I told you the story when I went to UTA and my major failure <laughs> there. Um, but when I was in architecture school, I was not failing. I was actually excelling, but it was extremely stressful for me. And I love architecture, but in that moment, I realized it was something that I did not want to do for the rest of my life. Um, I, I'm a free spirit, and I want to be able to be free in what I'm doing and not with architecture, things have to be just like this, not overlapping. Is just like this, has to be precise. And although I like structure, I have a tendency to veer away from structure. And so in that moment, I decided that I wanted to live and not just, and not just exist. So my parents said, what are you gonna do with an art degree? I said, I'm going to live. I'm just not going to exist. So it started there. It started there to follow my passion and not to be afraid because 
one thing, if you put your heart and mind behind something that you want to do, you're going to excel at it as long as you don't have other people in your head interfering with that. But you can do anything that you put your mind to, and you can excel at it. Jennifer, thank you so much. We applaud you. We see you. And we just appreciate you so, 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 so much. I don't have the words, but we're all here because we love you. We admire you. And you are seen. You thank are seen. You. Thank I you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Can everybody enjoy? Everybody enjoy? Yeah. yeah. Um, on the back side of this wall is the documentary that Broadway Dallas did on me. Um, it's about, it's under 30 minutes long if you want to congregate on the back side of this wall and it's playing there, but it's just under 30 minutes. So I hope you enjoy. And Jay is also working on a documentary as well that will debut maybe the end of the year, next year. Yeah, when she finishes and will just follow us on social media, follow Missy, follow uh, Daughter of Dallas, also Daisha, myself, Pencil on Paper, because we're all featured in that. Um, and the cool thing about that documentary is that we're, it's all our zodiac signs. So it's, I'm an air sign, Daisha is a fire sign, Missy is a water sign, and Val is a land sign. And just all the elements coming together in that documentary is I can't wait, but this is the first one back here that Broadway Dallas did on me. And I want to mention the painting that I did for Broadway Dallas. They purchased it. It was not donated. <laughs> and it's important for me to say that because a lot of times we get, we get asked to donate stuff, but they bought that piece, and it's part of their permanent collection. And it's hanging in the lobby at the music hall. So I want to um, thank Broadway Dallas for seeing me and doing the documentary because they followed me around all day. We did six stops. So they started out in my studio. Uh, we went by Dacia's Gallery, went to Twin Falls Park. We went to Indigo 1745, where I have my wearable art. We also went to the Limited Engagement Gallery, where I curated a show that, that Jamila was in, um, along with Carl and um, some of our Othello pieces and Vanessa Meshack, they were all in the show along with a few other artists. Um, and we ended up at the um, music hall. So I want to thank them for doing this documentary and seeing me worthy enough to do um, this documentary on me. So enjoy. <laughs> 